or the current uh, flag bearer of the party as the leader going into the polls. The neck of the party has just endorsed that. Also, we'll be going to the United States of America and also the UK to find out why people are pouring onto the streets over Black Lives Matter. Details of all of this coming up shortly. Here are the highlights, uh, by the way, of what's happening in Ghana. The governing New Patriotic Party, the NPP, has accepted President Akufuado as the party's flag bearer for the December 7 elections. President Akufuado is expected to be declared uh, as the flag bearer of the party by popular acclamation. The party's general secretary, John Buedu, made the announcement after a national, council, national executive council meeting of the party lay earlier today. Right, uh, we are staying with issues of politics. The opposition National Democratic Congress in the Western region has expressed worry at the breakdown of the BVR machines, as the biometric verification machines, for the piloting of the voter registration exercise. The party insists that the exercise is ill-conceived and has the tendency to erode the country's democratic credentials. Some aggrieved June 3 disaster victims have refuted claims of being compensated. At a wreath-laying ceremony in remembrance of the dead, the survivors accused the assembly of not giving them what is due. Now the Accra International Conference Center, that is the AICC um, building, is gradually sinking um, and is awaiting collapse, according to engineers. The 29-year-old facility has only uh, one rehabilitation, has seen only one rehabilitation since the construction, and as some of these columns holding the building structure have decayed and rusting, showing the iron rods protruding. All right, so those are the local headlines we have for you. Let's find out what's happening elsewhere around the world. And you would know that the major discussion right now has somewhat shifted from COVID-19 to Black Lives Matter following the death of George Floyd in the United States of America. Uh, now, the police officers, four of them who were, you know, some actually watched or looked on as uh, the life was being snuffed out of George Floyd, all those officers have been charged. So the latest is that the court documents have shown that the three former U.S. police officers seen watching as Derek Chauvin knelt on Judge Floyd's neck will now also face charges. Meanwhile, Chauvin has been charged with a second-degree murder in addition to the initial third-degree murder charge. Second-degree murder carries a maximum prison sentence of 40 years. And following that, we'll see how the demonstrations and protests globally will um, be affected by this latest decision. Now to the continent. The Gambia has demanded a credible investigation after the son of a diplomat was shot dead by U.S. police. According to preliminary investigation by Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Mamadou Lain Sisi, 39, was shot after a car chase in Georgia on Friday morning. The police said he had produced a gun, uh, for which reason they fired at him. Iran's president Hassan Rouhani has warned restrictions may have to be reimposed to fight the coronavirus if the country is hit by a second wave of infections. Iran has suffered the worst coronavirus outbreak in the Middle East with 160,696 cases and over 8,000 deaths. The country has reported 3,134 new infections in the past 24 hours. This is your Election Command Center TV3 Media General and all our sister stations are poised to bring you comprehensive coverage of the 2020 general elections.
For now, though, let's find out what the parties have been up to. The Opposition National Democratic Congress in the Western region has expressed worry at the breakdown of the biometric verification machines for the piloting of the voter registration exercise. Now, the party insists that the exercise is ill-conceived and has a tendency to erode the country's democratic credentials, but the governing NPP disagrees. Eric Yaoje has more on this and... Uh, Will be okay. So let's go straight to Skype and speak with him. And if you've been following developments uh, in our electoral space, you would know that, for instance, um, the Electoral Commission's pilot exercise ended today. It was a two day exercise just to test and see how the process would be like. In the Western region, we are told that there has been some suspension of the, uh, of the exercise. We'll go to him shortly. But to the Ashanti region now, we know that the exercise uh, went on quite uh, successfully. Preliminary results we are hearing indicate that it has been okay. William Evans Inkum is our man on the ground in the Ashanti region. He's been covering um, you know, the length and breadth of the Ashanti region. He's joined us via Skype. Evans, good evening and thank you for your time. Can you give us a wrap, you know, more like a mental picture of the entire exercise as of yesterday and today? Well, so let's look at this from two perspectives. Um, yesterday, that is day one, the exercise was very smooth. I think the focus on how the EC was going to ensure that people are adhered to the social distancing protocol and other um, WHO safety protocol as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Of course, how the measure that they're also going to put in place to ensure that um, adhering to these measures become very easy for the potential voter. Yes, I mean, when it comes to um, fiscal distance and that was ensured, measures, one would say a, a good measure was put in place as far as that particular narrative is concerned. So uh, enough aisle or spaces for the potential um, I mean, voter to walk through. Um, the, the, the chairs were, were also arranged in such a way that you could see a clear, I mean, two meters um, stretch from each chair. So that was also observed. Veronica Barkett were also um, stationed at vantage positions to at least um, welcome the potential um, voter to wash his or her hands regularly. Then sanitizer. For sanitizer, only saw one. That is um, the table where the lamination of the card was done. Um, that's the very place that the card is, is also issued. A sanitizer was there. So before you get your card, you have to sanitize your hand. The officer there will also have to sanitize his hands before the card um, is issued. Then on the BVR machine, uh, where the fingerprint are also taken, I also saw uh, a, a, one would say a sanitized tissue. So intermittently, the BVR, that particular uh, scanner, is um, wiped with this alcohol induced. Um, tissue and of course where the first information of that particular uh, potential voter is collected um, before the BVR or the data is entered or imputed into the database of the EC mm -hmm. um, you could see some level of the, there's a tissue there as well so if you're talking about all the necessary materials be, be in it alcohol be in it water being it um sanitizer or whichever you want to put it that i mean which have to be available for the potential um, voter to at least to uh, prevent uh, mm. one would say the contraction of uh, uh covid 19 i think they were all put in place now today i think the focus was on the bvr because intermittently um, developed hitches here and there um, the exercise was supposed to have started at 8, but it um, delayed for close to two hours because the BVR machine was uh, misbehaving or had developed hitch. Um, at 9.30, there was another issue with the BVR machine, so the whole process was halted. Then at 11.30, um, the, the machine was also had developed a hitch, so the process was halted once again for about 10 minutes. So there was some kind of intermittent um, hitches as far as the BVR is concerned. So mm -hmm. the Electoral Commission, Director of Electoral Commission, as far as that part, uh, the Ashanti region is concerned, explained that if the BVR was actually set on demo mode. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the reason why it was given that kind of um, hitches. 
but on the D-Day, it will be set on live mode. These okay. were his te the technical words that he, he gave us, and we, 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 we are likely to see a different narrative as far as uh, the process is concerned. Right, Martin. Evans, um, the, the major concern going into this exercise, uh, the pilot exercise, was the opposition NDC and some civil societies uh, raising concerns about the need to even compile a new voters register. Were their representatives present at this ex, um, pilot phase? And what were their um, initial observations? What did they tell you? Well, so the one concern that I quite remember yesterday, the Ashanti Regional Secretary of the Party, Kwame Zou, raised has to do with the arrangement that if the UC will be able to control affairs as it did yesterday, uh, because you know, it, this was a dress rehearsal, so the number of people that even came there to go through the process, these were people that have been called. So it was an arrangement for that. But then you ask yourself, would they be able to make the same arrangement when a larger or a chunk of people troop to the various voting centers? What I think is also another issue altogether. For instance, uh, before you get to the first stage of the process, I mean, you are given a chair or a chair is provided, um, and so you relax and all of that. But um, when we get to the DD, mm, we seem to have um, to be having some technical challenges in reconnecting uh, with Evan Tinkum. So we will get back to him. Uh, oh, okay, so yeah, yeah, William, time. yeah, you were wrapping up. If you can do that briefly for yes. me. Yes, yes. Yes, where the DD will have to handle the larger number of people, would they be able to uh, make the same arrangement? I think that was a concern that the Electoral Commission, uh, the representative of the various political parties, parties actually raised. Martin. Raised. All right, we'll come back to you to get feedback of how those who participated, what their uh, experiences were as compared to previous times, and whether or not they were willing to follow the COVID-19 protocols put in place by the EC. So stay with us, William Evansinko. Let's swing from the Ashanti region to the Western region now. And Eric Yaoje is a man who has been uh, covering the entire Western region. And he's joined us of uh, Skype as well. Um, good evening and thank you for your time, um, uh, Eric Eje. Eric Eje, I was about to say William Evansinko. Eric, thank you for joining us. Uh, the talking point from the Western region about uh, yesterday and today's exercise has been the suspension of the, um, you know, the registration. What can you tell us about it? Uh, thank you very much, um, Martin. Um, indeed, the, the talk about has been the suspension of our exercise um, today. Um, yesterday, the exercise indeed started um, around 8.15, um, everything was going on smoothly. We were at the station for about up until one o'clock when we left the the regional office in Second D. Mm -hmm. um, so from there we came, we went to the office and we didn't hear of anything. But this morning when we got to the place, I was inquiring how the exercise um, went yes yesterday, and I was told that it went smoothly, except that when at about 2.30, the machine started developing some faults. So at 3 o'clock, they had to stop the exercise. And if you look at the letter that the EC itself uh, brought out, they, it states that the exercise will take place from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. But it didn't start at 7. It started at 8 o'clock. And they we're told that they ended at 3 o'clock. And this was as a result of the fact that and they were having challenges with, with the BVI machine that they were using to capture the bio data of their prospective applicant. Right. So they told us that um, they were able to register some 73 persons and 52 of them were males and um, 13 of them were females. So they were, I spoke with one of them and he told me that had it not been for the challenge, he showed that they would have hit 100 that day. Mm. And um, on the issue of why they could not complete the exercise today, what was the reason given? They said the machines were not working well. What exactly were the words of the Electoral Commission? Okay, so this morning we got there at um, 7 o'clock because I had to do a live report on Onya TV. When we got there, the place was about being setting up. We saw the EC 
officials trying to put one and two together. And I met about six persons who were there already, even before seven, wanting to uh, register. Um, we were there, and when it was 8 o'clock, we saw about three of the EC and Reuters fidgeting with the BVR. Um, so that went on for 30 minutes. Then they left and went into one of the offices. Came back and they start one of into the ears of the prospective um, applicants there, and the two other guys went to the BVR machine, started to change some calls at the back of the machine that didn't work, and that went on also went on for about 45 minutes. Then mm -hmm. we saw them packing off the machine. Um, they we didn't get any official statement as to the reason why they packed off the machine. But then I can report that they didn't even start mm. for us to say that they, there was a breakdown. So today they didn't even register a single applicant. And so um, that was what happened. Um, about two o'clock, I had the chance to speak with the regional um, electoral Commissioner, um, Madam Angelina Tego, and it was a very brief discussion. She mm -hmm. just told me that they developed a fault and they've sent their report to Accra and the exercise cannot continue. I had wanted to ask, so what's the way forward? But mm -hmm. then she didn't give me any answer. So um, one of the, the political party representatives, that is the Deputy Western Region Secretary for the New Patriotic Party, Rex Dunfia, got furious because then there was no official communication as to why they suspended the exercise. So right. he went inside, and when he came back, he told me that he, she was, he was giving the same explanation that the machine had developed a fault, for which reason they cannot continue. He okay. asked the woman, um, what's the way forward, and... Uh, in his words, the woman told him that um, it, they are not going to do anything again. So it means that um, we, we lost Registration the was over for, for today. Yes. Okay. Yes, we lost the opportunity. And, for and uh, to finally, what, what can you tell us about um, the participants, those who were able to partake in the, um, the, the exercise, the pilot exercise yesterday and today? What were their uh, thoughts on it generally? And also, while at it, give us a brief Paint a brief picture to us about the social distancing and all the health protocols that the EC said they were going to put in place. Okay, so yesterday I spoke to about three persons who had successfully completed the process and they told me that um, so far, so good. Um, Averagely, they spent between 10 to 15 minutes and according to them, they think that it is okay. Mm. Um, but today, because nobody was able to register, there was a lot of a disappointment because people had come all the way from um I, I spoke with a certain gentleman who told me that he came all the way from Takwa. Mm. That's about a one and a half hour drive from Takrade to come and register because that was the only time he would get the opportunity to register. Right. But then um the exercise had been suspended. So I asked him whether he was told that the card that he would get is a genuine card. That is a card that he can use for voting. Mm. And he said that, well, he, he was not told anything to that effect, but he believes that uh, it is something that the, he can use for other purposes. And I okay. told him that this is just a demonstration. Right. So one worrying uh, factor that I picked was whether there was a communication to the applicant that this is just a demonstration card, for which okay. reason, if they start the voter registration proper, they would have to come back. Because mm. like I said, people were at the regional office as early as 6.30. Mm. So that is something probably the EC will have to look into. For okay. the issue of social distancing, I think that it was fairly okay mm. because the, the main entrance into the yard, I saw two big Veronica buckets there. And when you, are, when you disinfect, there's a gentleman there that takes your thermometer. And after you are made to join a queue and... The, the, the chairs are about one, two meters um, away from Apart. each other. And on each, yes, on, and on each table too, there was a very big sanitizer that both the enumerators and the prospective applicants were using. were using. So 
it was fairly okay. All right. Thank you so much, um, uh, Eric Yaoje. He is our Western Regional Correspondent helping us understand what happened there. And just by way of information, what happened yesterday and today were just pilots to test and see whether and how effectively the machines would work. So ending of this month, the month of June to the ending of um, July, the Electoral Commission will be undertaking the new voter registration exercise proper. So you are not going to be disenfranchised. But thank you once again, um, Eric Yaweji. Let's go back again to the Western, to the Ashanti region, I should say, and wrap up with William Evans Incom. Uh, what was were, what was your observation um, yesterday regarding the applicants who came there to come and register? Did they follow these protocols? And what did they tell you generally about their experience? Well, I think in terms of time frame or duration that one will have to spend going through the process, they were fairly satisfied. Um, I followed two cases. One has to do with somebody who had come with two guarantors, uh, somebody that... I would describe as semi-literate, um, semi in the sense that um, there are people who will not be able to give you um, details easily or information about themselves easily as you would have expected them to do. Um, so um, sometimes you need to um, kind of dig deeper for them to be able to give some accurate information about themselves. So um, it took this person 15 minutes to go through the entire process from stage one, where um, the, the information or the basic information about that particular person is collected, stage two, where the person picture is taken and that information imputed into the database of the Electoral Commission. Then the three, where the lamination mm -hmm. is done for the card to be issued to that particular person. Then the second case I followed had to do with this particular person I call uh, illiterate. Um, he, he only spent nine minutes going through the process um, he didn't come with any guarantor so if we sh if everything is working perfectly then i'm not sure there will be a, the ec will have a challenge registering a lot of people but again the problem has to do with the uh, bvr machine that they cannot trust because anytime it breaks down anytime it develops a hitch it takes quite a while before um, it is fixed. But we were told that this is a demo and it was set on a demo mode. We just want to believe, uh, we just want to take them by their word that it was set on a demo mode. And on the on the D-Day, we're not going to have a situation like that. If we are going to have a situation like that, then that will be a very, very big blow because it's something that the various politicians, especially those coming from the opposition side, have been raising concerns with, Martin. Um, limited, uh, in fact, it was just more like a trial, you know, um, a pilot trial of how the um, registration exercise is going to go. And it is, it was yesterday and today has ended. The EC is yet to give a firm position on what happened, what they observed. We'll keep you posted on that in our subsequent bulletins. This is your election command center. If it has to do with politics, we are your trusted source. All right, um, still talking about politics, though, the New Patriotic Party has been very busy as of today, they have declared the president, Nanado Danko Kufado, as the man who will lead them into the uh, December polls. Uh, the National Executive Committee met today and have made that decision. Also, they have given the 20th of June as the day that they will be holding the uh, parliamentary primaries in the constituencies where they have sitting MPs. That is in about 168 different constituencies where MPP has executives, uh, has members of parliament, I should say, they will be holding the parliamentary primaries on the 20th of June. Details of this when we return from the break shortly. This is News at 10, The Stands. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is The Stands. On Wednesdays, uh, we just share our opinions on a number of the national issues. Today, uh, we're going to the camp of the New Patriotic Party because uh, the NPP has uh, accepted... President Akufuado as the party's flag bearer for the December 7 elections. The president is expected to, de to be declared as the flag bearer of the NPP by popular acclamation. Meanwhile, the NPP is expected to organize its parliamentary primaries for constituencies where they have sitting MPs on the 20th of June. The primaries will be held at the electoral areas. Previously, the format used uh, to entail all delegates meeting at one place 
to vote and elect a candidate. The primaries, which should have been held in April, had to be postponed through uh, throwing the party's calendar into uh, some disarray. But uh, just this evening, we've, been, we've received a statement from the NPP, and I'm going to be reading it verbatim. It's been signed by the General Secretary of the party, John Boedu, and that is just more like a wrap of what happened after the meeting. So on your screens, you, show, you saw the executives of the party, the national executives, that is, meeting earlier today to discuss and finalize a number of major issues happening within their camp. So here's the statement from the NPP having to do with their elections and the uh, president. The NPP has scheduled the 20th of June 2020 to hold its parliamentary primaries in the 168 constituencies where the party has sitting MPs to elect its parliamentary candidates for 2020 general elections. The party has also resolved to acclaim the sole candidate who had filed his nomination to contest in the presidential primaries, that is His Excellency Nana Adudankwe Kufadu, as the party's 2020 presidential candidate. These critical decisions were taken by the party at a National Executive Committee and National Council meeting jointly held on Wednesday, June 3, 2020, at the Alisa Hotel. The date for the acclamation of the president of the presidential candidate and the running mate will soon be communicated to the general public equally the party will soon issue guidelines for the conduct of its parliamentary elections so that's the statement that just came in from the npp signed by the general secretary john Buedu. stay with your election command center we'll keep you posted on everything having to do with elections Let's uh, change subjects now and go straight to the United States of America. Following um, international developments, you would tell that the world has shifted discussions on COVID-19 to a new subject having to do with black lives. So court documents show that the three former U.S. police officers seen watching as Derek Chauvin knelt on George Floyd's neck will now face charges. Meanwhile, Chauvin has been charged with second-degree murder in addition to the initial third-degree murder uh, that was slapped on him. Second-degree murder carries a maximum prison life or prison sentence of 40 years. And so we want to find out really what the situation has been like. And today will be the ninth night since protests started in the United States of America, specifically Minneapolis. But then we are told that several other states are recording similar problems, uh, similar protests, I should say, and that has actually spilled into other countries. We've seen protests in the United States of America, in the UK, Tokyo, and some other parts of the world, all in solidarity of what happened to George Floyd. Let's take you down memory lane or have a chronology of events, how they unfolded, and how come we, found we are finding ourselves where we are today. On the 25th of May, George Floyd died in the hands of police. And you can see from the picture beside uh, this um, bullet point, the knee of um, Derek Chauvin on George Floyd, where he was shouting and was begging for his life, saying he couldn't breathe, but the man in the police uniform did not mind and had two other officers beside him, in fact, three other officers who looked on unconcerned. A day after that, um, the officers were told were sacked or were fired from their post. A day after their sacking, there were protests that started from Minneapolis, but quickly caught on, and several other cities in the U.S. started protesting. There have been looting, there have been destruction of property, which are all side issues. Because of that, the governor activated the National Guard on the 28th of May so they can bring some sanity uh, to what was happening. 29th, the officer was arrested and was charged with third-degree um, murder. On uh, 30th of May, prosecution changed hands and now the family has also done it on autopsy and said that uh, what was initially said to have been the cause of the death of George Floyd was not so. The 1st of June, independent autopsy revealed that the death was a homicide caused by asphyxia due to the lack um, of blood flowing to uh, you know, the major parts of his body, specifically his brain. And on the 2nd of June, civil rights charged um, um, some files against the Minneapolis police for certain developments. We'll come back to the rest of the developments in the U.S. Let's, for now, though, go to Skype and find out what the situation is like 
on the grounds. Benjamin Teta is a Ghanaian journalist in the U.S., specifically New York. Um, he's joined us via Skype. Good evening, Benjamin, and thank you for your time. Good evening and a, a big welcome. Right, to start with, you are in black, and um, in the last few days, the color black seems to have been the most dominant color or talked about color, not just because of our skin, but just to make a major statement that we have had enough. What can you tell us has been the situation in where you are, specifically in New York, as people respond to what happened to George Floyd? Um, well, yes, first of all, I'm in black, obviously, because it's... it's um, it, it sort of reflects the somber mood currently in the United States. And the fact that um, this is going on, obviously, um, is disheartening. And so there's no other color to represent it by, but in black. Uh, as of tonight, it's just about past 6.30 here. In about an hour and a half, we're going to have curfew here in New York. Um, there have been several states across the U.S. that have declared curfew. Obviously, because uh, not because of COVID-19, interestingly, but as a bid to curtail uh, night protests, which sometimes have degenerated into the rioting and looting that we witnessed. Um, so tonight, I mean, earlier throughout today in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in several parts of New York, same way in other states, in Houston, Texas, in Minneapolis, in California, Throughout the United States, protests are going. And the beauty of this protest, Martin, is the fact that it is mixed people, various people of various races coming onto the streets to protest. And this is what has also baffled authorities here. And um, even right in front of the White House, for the past several days, there have been protests. In fact, there were instances where people had wanted to basically break into the White House. Obviously, security and the walls wouldn't have permitted it anyway, but people still were venturing overnight. Between last night and today, um, the military were deployed just tonight. Even prison guards, prison guards were brought all the way from places like Texas to come and, pro to come and protect the presidency in the, in, in the White House. So yeah, it sort of reflects the mood of people who are out on the street protesting what's been going on. And have you joined the protest yourself? Um, we saw some looting, some you know side issues. Clearly, when you have these numbers of people pouring onto the street, you can't you know control all of them. There have been side issues, but were you part of the protest? And what was the message they wanted to send? Um, Sadly, I haven't been part of the protest. Um, I have gone out. I have watched and witnessed some of the protests. I've spoken to some protesters. I've spoken to shop owners. Um, yesterday, I went out and I witnessed some of the distractions that were caused, but also the fear it put into small business owners, which have of, often been targeted by some of the people. And But obviously, the mood is clear. The message people are sending is, enough is enough. And it took the United States centuries to make simple, um, simple steps. The U.S. prides itself, itself as the country of the free world. Mm. They talk about liberty. They talk about freedoms. And yet, it seems often other people, especially minority groups, have often faced these consequences. They faced police brutality. They faced unju unjust and unlawful arrests. They faced um, unfair, I mean, when it comes to judicial system, when it could judicial system policing, when it comes to other sectors of the economy, you've seen issues like that. So people are saying enough is enough. This is the time to make change. Mm. And also, let's not forget instances in the past where these things have happened, from Trevor Martin to several uh, Sandra Blanks, Sandra Blanks, and all the rest. When the incidents happen and they die, suddenly, the police involved are cleared. Mm. And often from the judiciary, you go to see that several of those benches are filled with white majority. Mm. And so when it goes to the court, it goes to court, those cases do not, I mean, get any fair um, ruling. This is mm. why people are saying we are going to remain on the streets until we see something done in relation to um, um, George Floyd. Okay. We'll come to you to find out Okay, so then this is not the first time we've seen these kinds of protests after the unfortunate killing of a black person. It's been happening 
over years, and then this seemed to have a different taste or a different stunt to it. We'll come and find out what they could actually achieve through this. But before that, uh, let's listen to George Floyd's son, Quincy Jones Floyd, uh, Quincy Mason Floyd, who spoke earlier today at his father's um, death place in Minneapolis. He told reporters and the protesters who had gathered there that he was out there trying to get justice for his father. We want justice for what's going on right now. Everyone showing him some support and love. I thank y'all for that. I just want to thank them for supporting my family and receive justice. Um, go ahead, Andrew. So he says he wants justice for his father. And Ben, is he going to get that justice, you think? And what, what would justice even mean? Hmm. Good question, and obviously tangible questions in that. But yes, his brother was responding to um, a bit of hope, which brought some of the protesters celebrating, breaking out with jubilation when it was announced today that um, the Attorney General of uh, Minnesota, um, Kit Allison, Allison, has suddenly announced that, well, they are going to review the cases. First of all, um, the police officer, the white police officer who blatantly, who callously placed his knee on the neck of Judge Floyd. Previously, they he was charged with a third degree murder. Now it's been reversed. It's been upgraded to second degree murder. And it's also announcing that they're also charging the three other officers who had so far had not been charged. This is uh, Thomas Lane, uh, Tu Chao, and J. Alexander Quinn. They were the three other officers who were looking on. In fact, one of them was seen, not even one, about two or so were seen at the stage, also kneeling on top of George Floyd. Mm. And when bystanders, bystanders who were watching and were hearing the cry of George Floyd, they had wanted to intervene. They were telling them, stop this, stop this. In fact, some of these officers, Thomas, To, and Alexander walked forward and, and were pushing those people back. In other words, they were also aiding and abetting. Right. So now they've also been charged with second degree murder and also second degree manslaughter. Mm. So yeah, this is why uh, he gave the brother a bit of hope that yes, at least things are beginning to, to, to first be hastened, but hopefully there's still more to be done in terms of when it goes to, the, to court, how it's going to um, play out there. All right. Thank you very much uh, for making time to speak with us this evening. Benjamin Tete is a Ghanaian journalist living in the United States of America, specifically New York, and is schooling there as well. well he's, and uh, he's been giving us an update on development there. Always a pleasure talking to you, Benjamin. Meanwhile, world leaders have been speaking and sharing their opinions on this development. Let's find out what some of these uh, thoughts are. We know that the Pope has spoken. Uh, we know that uh, former President Barack Obama has also spoken or is being forced to say something. But um, here's the statement that the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nanade Dankwe Kufado, released. And he says in part that black people the world over are shocked and distraught by the killing of an unarmed black man, Judge Floyd, by a white police officer in the United States of America. It carried with it an all too painful familiarity and an ugly reminder, it cannot be right that in the 21st century, the United States, this great bastion of democracy, continues to grapple with the problem of systematic racism or systemic racism. On behalf of the people of Ghana, I express my deep condolence to the family and loved ones of the late George Floyd. We stand with our kith and kin in America in these difficult and trying times, and we hope that the unfortunate tragic death of Judge Floyd will inspire a lasting change in how America confronts head-on the problems of hate and racism. That's from Nana Adudankwa Ekufwa, the President of the Republic of Ghana, and he treated that with a picture of George Floyd. Uh, another world leader who's spoken is um, Pope Francis, head of the Catholic Church. He says, Dear brothers and sisters in the United States, I have witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest in your nation in these past days following the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd. We cannot tolerate to turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the, um, the sacredness of every human life. That's what the Pope said. 
And to South Africa, Nalendi Pando is a minister in charge of international relations of South Africa. She says the violence that has characterized some of the protests seriously detracts from drawing international awareness to the legitimate concerns about violence against defenselessness, black people, and other minority in America. So those are the thoughts. Oh, yes, and our very own... Um, Jerry John Rawlings, pardon the mistake down here. Jerry John Rawlings has also uh, spoken about this. He says, if some of these atrocities, especially from some white police officers against black citizens, cannot shock the American populace to see evidence of their own decline, what can? That is a question that the uh, former president, Jerry John Rawlings, has asked. When we return from this short break, we'll be swinging straight to the United Kingdom and speak to one of our friends there who's also been monitoring developments about the protests uh, you know, ongoing in that country as well regarding the death of George Floyd. Truly, black lives do matter. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is The Stands, and today we are going global and following events happening in all other countries, specifically having to do with the death of uh, George Floyd, which has part, you know, caused a lot of massive protest globally. Let's go to the UK now. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he is appalled and sickened by the death of George Floyd and that his message to people in the United States is that, quote, racism or racist violence has no place in our society. So let's listen to him. Then we'll go straight and speak to our, our correspondent there. Uh, we mourn uh, George Floyd, and I was appalled and, and sickened to, to see what, uh, what, what happened to him. And my message to, uh, to President Trump, to everybody in the United States from, uh, from the UK, is that I don't think racism or, or race, and I, it's an opinion that I'm sure is shared uh, by the overwhelming majority of, of people around the world. Well, racism, racist violence has no place uh, in our uh, society. And uh, you mentioned the, the demonstrations. Um, Beth, uh, well, I, all I would say is that I do think uh, people have a right to protest, to make their feelings known about injustices such as, uh, as, what, as what happened to, to George Floyd. I would urge people to protest peacefully and in accordance with the rules on social distancing. All right, so that's Boris Johnson, UK Prime Minister. Clearly, the issue of racism is not just an American problem. It seems to be a global problem. In the UK, they've had their fair share of racism. Following that, they've also seen some protest. Edward Balami is a, is a Ghanaian student uh, studying in the United Kingdom. He's joined us via Skype to paint a picture for us how the protests in the UK have been. Uh, Mr. Balami, good evening and thank you for your time. Uh, good evening, Martin. Yeah, to start with, what can you tell us about the protests in the UK? It's something happening elsewhere. What does the UK's interest uh, what is the UK's interest in something happening in the US? Well, I, I think um, this one, it's, it's not just uh, what's happening in the US because it's a global issue. And the reason why UK has also joined um, this American problem, I should say, or issue, I should say, is because racism is everywhere. I have experienced that before in the UK, um, having been here. So it's a reason why people like feel it's enough. Enough is enough. It's now time for us to stand up to it. So you see that we speak to the issue mm. for things to change or we live in like that. Mm. So there have been a um, series of um, protests. One was held in Liverpool. That was yesterday. I was in work, so I couldn't join. And then another, uh, several others happened in London today which recorded huge numbers. Liverpool also had hundreds of people um, gathering in the city centre, a place called St George's Hall. And it was people from all walks of life. It wasn't just blacks, but whites, Hispanics, Asians, all of them were there showing support and calling um, what's going on a shame. Mm. So in London, um, it also happened today. It happened yesterday and then today it happened. Okay. But I think even the, the police had quite a tough time yeah. trying to control yeah. the crowd and all that. But um, it, it, they allowed it to go on anyway. So We actually saw images uh, and some videos from um, you know, Western media 
covering what was happening in the UK. Uh, if you, you, you monitored, can you tell us whether or not it also had spillovers where some people, you know, turned the whole thing chaotic and were vandalizing property? Or this was more peaceful as compared to what was happening in the US? Yeah, I think uh, so some of them did happen, especially in London. The Liverpool one, even though I didn't go, I, I monitored online and um, reports from a local uh, media house here in Liverpool, the Echo. It was peaceful and they all adhered to the rules and regulations that were given to them regarding um, peaceful protests. But elsewhere in London, some of the protesters did have a scuffle with, you know, with the police at a point and because the police also wouldn't control the crowd mm. um, they had to find another way to to disperse some of them so but talking about looting and vandalizing things it didn't really happen like that um, as far as um, reports um, say i believe the main aim for this these protests globally and in the uk where you are uh, has to do with change that they want to see Personally, do you believe there's going to be any major change in the UK after these protests? Yeah, there, there's going to be a change because if you don't stand up to something, if you don't, if you don't talk about the issue, it's not getting resolved anyway. Now, we feel like we've had enough because I have experienced racism before mm. uh, in, in my workplace. It didn't come from my employer, it didn't come from my, um, a, a colleague, uh, but it did come from the people. I, I, I was working with people with learning difficulties, and I have experienced that before. I've been called, the, uh, the, the N-words have been used on me mm. and all that. And it's a, it's a criminal offense, which I could call the police to come in. Mm. But I chose not to do that anyway for, mm. for, for other reasons. Mm. Um, so some of these things, as you see people coming out and protesting, saying enough is enough, um, we, f we feel their pain, there's going to be a change. It only takes one time for a change to happen. So it might not come maybe immediately, but eventually it will happen. Mm. I believe so. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, that's a hope we all hope and hold strongly that change will definitely happen. Edward Balami is a Ghanaian student in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Yeah. And uh, clearly, the conversation should continue. Let us make sure that there is change where every race is respected. Black lives indeed do matter, and black don't crack. I'm black and proud, and that is one of the things that I'm really, really proud about. Let's change subject now. On News at 10, we are shifting our attention to the date of today being the 3rd of June. And that clearly uh, in, in Ghana is a day we need to mark and make sure it does not recur. So some aggrieved June 3 disaster victims have refuted claims of being compensated. At a wreath laying ceremony in remembrance of the dead, the survivors accused the assembly of not giving them what is due. <laughs> Families of the victims who died in the twin fire and flood disaster and some survivors are still in pain. Most of the survivors are accusing authorities of not compensating them. Some victims claim they paid their own medical bills despite government assurance it would cover all of such bills. Five years on, they said they are yet to receive compensation from government. The money that we receive is from the Benin government. Even that day, it was the Benin ambassador who presented a check to AMA at the AMA office. And they didn't compensate with anybody here. That money doesn't call compensate. 2017, where Beni president can discharge $200,000, says they should use that money and support doing tear fraud and fire victim. Maybe 2019, then they share that money for us. That money, some get 10000 some get 8000 because our problem, we call some severe and minor. Minor, we get 8000 and severe, we get 10000 It didn't give any persuasive. It didn't, any old one where you go and need new one where you can, didn't give anybody money. In response, the Director of Relief at NADMO and Secretary of the June 3 disaster, Mahamadou Emmanuel Adani said all victims have been paid except two. We are dealing with human beings. Even if you give them the whole world, they will still tell you they are not satisfied. Mm. But what is 
recommended for them the amount of money that was received by NADMO and the measures we put in place to disperse so that at least everybody gets something was properly adhered to. We just have two people to deal with and what is happening is that we have run out of funds for just these two people. Kole Klote, Municipal Assembly, Ni Ajay Tewia said the Assembly has put in place measures to avoid future disasters in the area. And away from that, the 25-year-old man who tortured his three-year-old son, leaving him with deep injuries, has been convicted for assault and causing harm. Ebenezer Saibons was convicted on his own plea, but has uh, entered a new sentence deferred by the court. The convict's three-year-old son was hospitalized with severe wounds after he had flogged him with a belt and power cable for bed wetting. Deep cuts and marks spread over the boy's back, hands, thighs, and forehead. Ebenezer Osaibonsu pleaded not guilty to two counts of assault and causing harm. The convict was granted bail on the first adjourned date. However, on Monday, the convict changed his plea to guilty and pleaded for leniency. His lawyer, Amufa Kudia, said his client's decision was born out of remorse. He noted that thinking of the fact that he had actually beaten and inflicted those deep wounds on his son had been haunting his client, hence the U-turn. The convict, who faces a charge of second-degree felony, however, had his sentence deferred to June 9. And that's how we bring the bulletin to a close. I am Martin Esedu Dati. Thank you very much for watching. If you visit 3news.com, you'll find some more stories there to get updated. Do have a good evening and as always, stay positive. Bye for now.